Bună ziua! Hello everyone and welcome to the town hall of the Moldovan American Convention. Ten years ago, the Moldovan diaspora, still young and fragile, decided to meet here in Washington DC for the first edition of the Moldovan American Convention. We're still young, but we decided that together we can make a difference. From New York to Sacramento, from Chicago to Miami, to Seattle, to Philadelphia, to Asheville. Sorry. <laughs> we, de we decided that we can make Moldovan um, American diaspora stronger. A year later, the Canadian Moldovan diaspora uh, joined us from, from Montreal to Toronto to Edmonton, and we are working together since. Today, we are very excited to celebrate the 10th edition of the convention and are honored to be joined by distinguished guests, partners, and friends. It is my honor to introduce to you the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration, Mr. Mihai Popshoi, Deputy Prime Minister, Please join us on stage for, um, for opening remarks. You're right there. I was looking for you. Hello, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to meet all of you. And great thanks to Madam Dragolin for spearheading this effort for the 10th year now. It's, it's truly remarkable. We are known back home as a small country with a big heart. And we are showing this big heart by welcoming Ukrainian refugees. But our diaspora, and, and you, all of you, are showing your great heart by organizing such wonderful events that make Moldova's name sound respected in the United States. You are making a name for yourself by being contributors in your own community, but also contributing to the image of your country. So this support that you are providing to the Moldovan American Convention is truly invaluable to the bilateral relations between the United States and the Republic of Moldova, but also for building that good image of our country in the United States. So I'd like to commend every one of you for supporting this effort and, and the support that we've received from our partners, which is a big country with an even bigger heart. <laughs> the Republic of Moldova is there for our friends in Ukraine. And we also appreciate the support of our diaspora for our citizens back home. The stronger we are, the more united we are in these challenging times, the more we'll be able to resist all the channel challenges and all the problems that come our way. So on behalf of Moldovans back home, on behalf of the uh, government of the Republic of Moldova, of the parliament, of President Maya Sandu, I'd like to thank every single one of you for your civic participation, for your heart still being at home and wishing to contribute to the Republic of Moldova. And it's truly remarkable that we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this wonderful undertaking that unites all of us, despite being some of us uh, further away from home. But this unity, this solidarity is truly remarkable. So I'd like to commend you for your effort and your investment into the good image of the Republic of Moldova and for the peace and stability back home. Thank you for this effort, and I look forward to yet another great Moldovan American convention. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Development partners play a pivotal role in Moldova, Moldova's progress, contributing to the economic, social, and human development within Moldovan society by providing financial, technical, and humanitarian support. Today, we are here, we are honored to be joined by the administrator of the Agency 
U.S. Agency of International Development, Mrs. Samantha Power, Administrator. Please join us on stage. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it is really, really wonderful uh, to be here. Um, and congratulations on the 10th anniversary of the convention. Uh, Elena, as uh, founder and chairperson, you have been absolutely instrumental uh, in guiding the diaspora to support Moldova's uh, development, which lately has been meteoric. It really, really is a pace of economic and political development that I can say with my global vantage point uh, is very, very unusual. It's exceptional. I also want to thank uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Popshoyi, uh, who this is my second appearance with today, uh, two of what I'm sure will be many, because we uh, certainly at the, in the Biden administration, as, as uh, DFC uh, CEO Scott Nathan will also attest, we are always interested in lending whatever uh, political support or platforms we can uh, to giving Moldovan leaders uh, the chance to tell their story, and you tell it so well, and it's a hell of a story to tell. Um, so uh, really grateful for you being here and helping deepen the connections between the government and the diaspora, which are already very uh, rich. Thanks for everyone who has flown in um, here into the Thomas Jefferson Library of Congress building. Um, there is, uh, as is often the case in libraries, uh, an interesting story about Thomas Jefferson, the Library of Congress, and Moldova. Who knew? Um, 210 years ago, the Library of Congress was destroyed in a fire, along with most of its books. So Thomas Jefferson sold his collection of nearly 7,000 books to the US government to restart the library, including one written by uh, the Moldovan, Dmitry Kantemir, who was also a historian, a philosopher, a composer, and a linguist. Kantemir wrote the first substantial history of the Ottoman Empire in any European language that was the go-to text on the subject, as many of you know, for a century. Fast forward today, to today, and uh, right now the Library of Congress has more than 12,000 volumes on Moldova alone. From early histories exploring the principality of Moldavia to collections of Moldovan literature, and it is a true testament to the reach and the power of Moldovan culture, its history, and its heritage, a heritage that you are doing so much to protect and an independent spirit uh, that so many of you are doing so much to nurture. So uh, I think we've come to the right place. Uh, we are in the present committed to supporting the Moldovan people uh, as they chart their own future. Moldova is critical um, to uh, its own regions, develop the broader regions, de development, its peace, its security, and we, the United States, view Moldova as a really important long-term partner for us. USAID uh, has supported Moldova since the very beginning of its independence from the Soviet Union. Uh, since 1992, we have invested more than a billion dollars in Moldova, and we are continuing that support today at what is a critical inflection point uh, for the people of Moldova. As you all in this room know, and indeed thanks to many of your efforts, Moldova is at a moment of uh, transformation. Today, the Moldovan people are strengthening their democracy, building their security and independence of their energy supply and driving economic growth and investment uh, that benefit all Moldovans. Again, with a focus not just on economic growth, but on inclusive economic growth, which has not always been the area of emphasis. And he's doing all this even as, unfortunately, the Kremlin is doing everything in its power, everything possible really, to try to derail uh, many of these ambitions. So what I'm going to just use the brief time I have left doing is describing a little bit about uh, the work that USAID is doing uh, in Moldova and with Moldovans in the hopes that, as I describe it, you will see a role 
for yourselves somehow or people you know uh, in connecting with us and connecting with the work that we do because this is an all hands on deck moment uh, for Moldova. So um, first, I just talk about core democratic strengthening. Uh, some of you may know uh, that Moldova is a part of a flagship initiative for President Biden and for me personally, which is called the Democracy Delivers Initiative. And this is a global effort, but that handpicks specific countries where there are significant reform efforts underway, basically where there are democratization openings, reform openings, bright spots for democracy in a world that is backsliding in really profound ways uh, when it comes to democratic progress. So we have looked to find where in the world are there countries where uh, leaders are trying to enact democratic reform, root out corruption, and expand human rights rather than curtail uh, human rights. Um, and when these inspiring windows of opportunity arise, our goal is to open them further and to have the, or to have whatever the uh, political space is that a leader has to do hard things to try to have that uh, last longer or that space uh, to be larger. And so we come together with our partners and we try to surge catalytic support mainly, resources, we try to help brave reformers uh, as they work to deliver economically specifically because that's where the rubber meets the road for citizens. And Moldova is one of the countries that we chose uh, very early on. It was clear that this reform effort was serious and that it had an awful lot of headwind coming at it uh, that was trying to, to, to get in the way. So when it comes to democratic strengthening, we have supported ind independent media, which in turn is holding the current government accountable. So even though we appear often with the government, we are supporting the checks and balances as well on the government. Um, we want, uh, we are working to help citizens get access to more credible information. Obviously, citizens and government alike are being bombarded uh, with misinformation. We have trained more than 16,000 students in media literacy since 2017, equipping them with the skills to evaluate the reliability and objectivity of the information they are receiving. And this is really great. We are already seeing results uh, of these investments um, in the media sector and in media literacy. On the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index, Moldova has moved from a rank of 55 out of 179 countries a decade ago to now the rank of 28. Um, and under the leadership of President Sa Sandu, who I've met uh, many times, as I know uh, so has, has Scott, uh, including my two trips to Moldova as USAID administrator, where I got to sample Moldovan wine, uh, which I will never forget uh, and may come back to uh, here in my remarks. Um, Moldova has recently led a series of really um, important reforms uh, to try to bring it closer to EU membership. And so these are democratic reforms. Fulfilling EU accession requirements, it has to be clear, is no easy task for any country, as many of those countries who have been in the queue and <laughs> trying to fulfill uh, all the various chapters uh, can, can attest. But the government of Moldova is meeting uh, this challenge, already fulfilling seven of nine EU Commission requirements necessary for official uh, accession negotiations. Last December, as you well know, the European Council agreed to formally open those negotiations with Moldova, a testament to the transformational work that public servants, entrepreneurs, and citizens are undertaking to advance the country's progress. The second area of really important collaboration between USAID and the US government and Moldova is in helping the country build its energy security and independence, which of course is necessary. It's also a significant vulnerability. It is well known that historically Moldova has been almost completely reliant on Russia for its energy needs, a dependence that has become a tool for malign influence and indeed what you might call economic blackmail. Um, and that has come to a head really in the wake of uh, Putin's brutal uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So we help Moldova to stand up its newly reconstituted Ministry of Energy. Uh, just last year, 
and have since worked with this ministry, Energocom, and other international donors to offset the costs of more expensive energy during high energy use times, like of course winter, the tough Moldovan winter. Last year, and this is really extraordinary, the US Congress approved $300 million to help Moldovans improve domestic electric power generation and energy connections with Europe. And why, why is this extraordinary? It's extraordinary, it's a large sum of, of resources at a difficult budget time, but really it speaks to actually how much better known Moldova and its story is becoming uh, in Washington, up on Capitol Hill, and more broadly in the United States. And you all have a role uh, to play here. I remember, um, uh, Ambassador, when, when I was first uh, traveling uh, to, to Moldova and I was asking, you know, how many Codels have been to Moldova recently? Uh, the answer was not uh, a very, a very uh, encouraging one because I was thinking to myself, okay, we have to build a constituency on Capitol Hill. Well, how many members of Congress have tasted the wine? Uh, you know, how many have seen the industry of the people or the determination, uh, you know, of, of citizens to, to forge a democratic and a European path for themselves? And once you feel it up close, as you know, as, as Mol Moldovan Americans, it's an entirely different uh, commitment. That is changing more and more. Uh, we, are, we have been able to encourage members of Congress and others, to, or their staff, because that matters uh, sometimes almost as much, um, uh, to stop into Moldova and to see for themselves what this uh, little country that could uh, is up to. Um, in just a year, uh, Moldova is rapidly expanding its connections to the European energy grids and has transitioned 100% of the gas needs on the right bank of the Nistru River to alternative sources like solar and natural gas. Now the Moldovan people are on the way to accessing energy when they need to without fear of blackmail or without fear of the lights uh, going off. Lastly, I would just say USAID is working with the Moldovan government to revitalize uh, the economy, particularly focusing on key sectors. We are supporting entrepreneurs and business people to diversify the economy by building up exports like wine, textiles, and stone fruits. These efforts have been fruitful. Uh, USAID has supported farmers in getting the equipment and the certifications that they need to get produce on a scale and at a guaranteed quality that international buyers are seeking. And that has been the key matchmaking is working on the ground in Moldova with these sectors to make sure that they are actually meeting the tastes and the needs and the actual uh, regulatory requirements of the export markets uh, that, that farmers and other uh, businesses uh, seek to reach. Um, since uh, Moldo uh, uh, Moldova's plum exports as part of this uh, initiative nearly doubled from 22, uh, 2022 to 2023, and it has now become the largest exporter of plums in the Northern Hemisphere, the country has, and the third largest uh, in the world. Last year, grape exports also doubled, while sweet cherry exports increased fivefold. So these are real results, and again, a tribute above all uh, to Moldovan determination. We are also supporting the Moldovan people's efforts to bolster the economy uh, through tech advances. Since your last conference in Chicago, USAID facilitated a $1 million commitment from Google to support cyber resilience in Moldova, which is so important to all else, including the upcoming opening of the new Cyber Academy uh, in the capital, which is going to train the next generation uh, of Moldova's cybersecurity experts. It's gonna spearhead research and innovation and shore up the country's civilian cyber defenses. I'm glad to share that just a week ago, USAID also facilitated a partnership with the global technology company Cisco to support the Cyber Academy by offering the software, analytics, and tech equipment it needs uh, at a nearly 70% discount. We are excited to see what the future holds in store for Moldova, particularly with you, the diaspora community, at the ready to support Moldova's progress. Uh, as you are here to discuss, and I won't say much about this as I close, but there are so many different ways for you to get involved. 
You can invest and expand your businesses in Moldova, as I know many of you here today have done or are trying to do. You'll hear again more from DFC CEO Scott Nathan about how we can work together to attract the private sector to invest more in Moldova. You can choose to contribute your skills and knowledge as public servants in Moldova, uh, as I know several of you here today have done, um, and this, I will say, I find incredibly inspiring. Uh, special shout out to uh, Elena's daughter, uh, Veronica, uh, who uh, has become the chief uh, prosecutor uh, in the anti-corruption, uh, main anti-corruption body in Moldova. Such an important job in not only uh, spearheading democratic progress, but also paving the way for uh, investors to feel more excited about, about being in Moldova. When they know that corruption is being tackled, it's an entirely different conversation. You can advocate for important policy changes in Moldova and here in the United States, uh, particularly uh, as our own US Congress uh, is voting tomorrow, just steps from here, on critical national security legislation that will determine whether or not we can continue to give our Ukrainian partners the assistance they need to stand up uh, to Putin's aggression, uh, which threatens, of course, the entire region. You can directly uh, contribute your skills and resources through organizations like DHUB and Moldova Aid, and I wanna congratulate you all on creating an official NGO that can help channel the extraordinary potential of the diaspora community uh, 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 to support Moldova. Somebody likes this shout out here, so I'm glad about that. Um, and very last thing I'll say, but really in some ways the most fundamental, you can vote. I don't know if you've heard, but there's an important election coming up this fall, and not only the American presidential election, there's a major uh, important uh, election uh, happening in Moldova uh, uh, in October of this year. Moldova, for the first time in its history, is accepting mail-in votes from the United States and Canada as it gears up for a substantial increase in overseas votes. Having had some discussions today about this, this is not gonna be easy. Word of mouth is gonna be absolutely critical. Everyone, you will need to find 10 friends who themselves find 10 friends and 10 friends and so on and so on. So using your voice to get out the vote, this is an election, honestly, that is going to, to decide whether this dramatic transformation continues, whether it accelerates and deepens, or whether it is stopped in its tracks. This election matters so very much. Uh, I urge you to connect with your relatives, your friends, and your neighbors um, to, to, in Moldova as well uh, to get out the vote there. We are standing ready to assist you. We have colleagues at our mission um, from uh, Moldova who are here today to engage with you. If you have an idea, no idea is too crazy, you'd be amazed what we've been managed to hatch together from what started as a, as a wild and crazy idea. Um, but you have the resources, you have the knowledge, you have... Uh, the intellectual capital, we would love to work with you uh, and, of course, uh, the government to help you deploy uh, all of those resources uh, to great effect in a country that is doing really remarkable things. So thank you so much and thank you for having me. U.S. International Development Finance Corporation is finding solutions to the most critical challenges the developing world is facing today. We are honored to have the DFC CEO, Scott Nathan, joining us. Please join us on stage. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Elena, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's terrific to be able to address the uh, convention. And um, I guess I should start out by um, acknowledging the vice chair of our board at DFC, uh, my good friend and colleague, Samantha Power. Now, my remarks um, end up paralleling in many ways her remarks, but I think that's a testament to the close working relationship between our two organizations. I'm also gonna talk about economic development, energy independence, 
about the partnership between our countries, and I even have a wine story as well. Um, so that, that's a testament to our uh, close uh, relationship. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, it's great to be here with you. Uh, ambassador, it's uh, terrific to see you again twice uh, this week. And uh, our ambassador in Moldova, uh, Kent Logsdon, it's great to see you uh, as well. Um, but really, it's my honor to be able to address the Moldovan American uh, Convention. I had the opportunity to visit Moldova back in January, just a few um, months ago. And, um, you know, uh, it was an opportunity for me to highlight the uh, partnership between our two countries and all that we've achieved to see the firsthand impact uh, that working together uh, has uh, the difference that that has made. But it, it wasn't my first visit uh, to Moldova. Uh, back in the 1990s, I visited uh, Chisinau when uh, I was in the private sector. Uh, that was a very different time. Uh, it was just a few years after independence, and uh, on my recent visit to be able to represent the United States government, it was really uh, amazing to see all the progress that's been made. There's still a lot of work to be done, of course, but uh, in, in the span of uh, three decades, the really incredible progress uh, that's been made. So for more than 30 years, the United States has partnered with the Moldovan people and government to address challenges uh, facing the country and, and build um, on a democratic, prosperous, and secure future uh, for the country. In that time, uh, Moldova, as Samantha mentioned, has really emerged, and especially quite recently, as a true bright spot for democracy uh, in Eastern Europe. And the US government really values our partnership and is looking to continue deepening our, deepening our ties uh, in the years to, go, to come. Moldova is on the path to lasting reform, uh, tackling uh, issues around economic stagnation, corruption, as uh, Samantha mentioned, uh, energy insecurity, which is uh, an issue globally that keeps uh, economic growth down. Um, and of course, malign influence from outside the country that has also uh, been a challenge for economic growth. You know, no doubt things uh, changed dramatically uh, on February 24th, 2022, just over two years ago when Russia launched its full-scale invasion, its latest phase of aggression against Ukraine and its people. And I'd say uh, outside of Ukraine itself, there's probably no country more adversely affected uh, by this Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine uh, than Moldova. Um, of course, that was felt in the economy. You know, so uh, in that first year, the GDP of Moldova uh, fell, inflation became a problem. Uh, Russia continued its direct and indirect efforts to destabilize the Moldovan economy and government. And um, Moldova has had to rise to face these challenges head on. Uh, it's done so admirably, and the economy has begun to rebound uh, with renewed focus on uh, access to Western markets. Samantha talked about that and the importance of that in the agribusiness sector, um, making sure that uh, their access to markets for the outputs from uh, Moldova, uh, we've seen that uh, inflation has fallen and economic growth has begun uh, to return. Um, of course, Moldova has doubled down on building on its um, national defense, and the United States uh, stands ready uh, to support that. Moldova has been steadfast and vocal supporter of Ukraine, uh, welcoming a million refugees who have gone through the country fleeing the conflict. And uh, the United States, of course, appreciates the sacrifice of the Moldovan people and the burden that that's, this has placed on them. That's been reflected in increased uh, cooperation on the military front and financial support over the last uh, two years. Government-to-government uh, -government assistance is necessary, but to truly unlock uh, the power of any economy, and this is what my agency is really about. 
one needs to leverage private capital. Uh, the agency I oversee, the United States International Development Finance Corporation, uh, was created just uh, to address exactly this sort of challenge. Uh, our work, uh, our job is to work with the private sector to advance economic development in line with U.S. foreign policy objectives. We offer a variety of to tools to our clients, whether that's debt financing, equity investments, loan guarantees, uh, technical assistance, or political risk insurance. Our goal is to finance high standard uh, quality projects that align with our values uh, and make local impact in a transparent and inclusive way uh, that respects high labor and environmental standards. In Moldova, uh, we have found the ability to make just these sort of investments. DFC has recently focused on a number of opportunities uh, to work with the private sector to boost the Moldovan economy. I visited um, Chisinau uh, in January uh, to give more visibility, to highlight some of these investments. Uh, we've made a total of a little more than $400 million of investments uh, in Moldova. And uh, one of the things that we're very focused on is exploring more opportunities to work together to support the private sector and make a difference for the Moldovan economy. Um, during my visit, I had a chance to visit with the Prime Minister and the President uh, to discuss our interest in uh, pursuing investments in priority sectors like renewable energy, small business support, uh, digital infrastructure, and agriculture. I also met with Horizon Capital, uh, who I understand is co-hosted one of this morning's uh, sessions to evaluate the progress on the $25 million investment we've made with them uh, to support high-tech businesses uh, both in Moldova and Ukraine. Um, finally, I had the chance to go out to dinner and uh, sample way too many different types of uh, Moldovan red wine uh, with M Ambassador Lagsden, but uh, like Samantha, that was a highlight of my trip. I actually returned home with a case of wine uh, that can't help select um, that I've been able to share with friends and family and also help make a dent in the balance of trade because I was surprised it's not cheap, uh, the, the Moldova wine, uh, but it's um, very high quality. Um, so the Development Finance Corporation is a relatively new agency. Our, our predecessor, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, um, has been involved in Moldova for a long time. Uh, and that has especially been focused on supporting small business. Uh, when I was in Moldova, we had the chance to celebrate our relationship with uh, MABE, Agro Ind Bank uh, of Moldova. Uh, we have a loan portfolio with them that has gone to uh, some more supporting entrepreneurs, uh, micro, small, and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, that work in manufacturing, wine production, uh, and the creative sector. Our largest commitment in Moldova, however, uh, like the work of USAID, has been focused on energy security. Uh, I mentioned that at the beginning. Energy security is critical to the growth of any economy, and it's obviously been a challenge uh, for Moldova, particularly uh, over the last two years uh, with Russia's expanded aggression against Ukraine. Um, we can't allow any nation to weaponize access to energy. Uh, that, that's, um, that's bad for economic growth, that's bad for people, it's completely unfair and something that we need to fight against. And so with the support of the international community, it's really quite impressive what Moldova has been able to achieve in diversifying, uh, first, the gas supply, um, so that it's no longer dependent on Gazprom for its gas supply. Uh, since February of 2022, Moldova has accelerated its plans to interconnect with the grid, uh, as Samantha mentioned, the grid in Europe, um, and this is a significant achievement for Moldova. But at DFC, what we're most proud of is the $400 million in political risk insurance that we provided to our partners uh, who participated in the gas tenders to help diversify away from Gazprom Gas and the success that that's achieved uh, in Moldova in terms of breaking that grip uh, is really uh, impressive and something very much worth 
celebrating. We're excited by what we've accomplished in partnering with Moldova and the private sector, but we want to do more, and we want to work with any of you who have interesting projects for us. Our goal is to get capital to the private sector to expand business, keep people employed, uh, and grow the economy. Uh, I had the chance to meet um, Viktor Parlikov, the energy minister of Moldova earlier this week, and we talked a lot about opportunities in the energy sector, but we want to go beyond that and uh, work with small and medium enterprises to help grow the economy. So uh, I'll conclude by saying that we're continually working with our interagency partners as well as our partners in Moldova, and I want to call out uh, the American Chamber of Commerce in Chisinau is an important partner uh, as we seek out more opportunities uh, to, for DFC involvement and investment where we can make a difference. We're open for business in Moldova. That's my final message I want to leave you uh, with. And we remain committed to supporting the Moldovan economy, uh, democracy in Moldova, and freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. As all of you know, these days are very important. I'm very busy here on the Hill and the administration and uh, everywhere and all the institutions. Um, all hands are needed on deck, and that's why some of our guests might have to leave earlier. We're not uh, urging you to leave now, but <laughs> whenever you feel the, the need to leave, uh, we want to thank the first panel. So a round of applause and our big thanks for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor to have you here. Wow. Um, all hands on deck are needed also in Moldova. That's why we have uh, uh, this title for our next um, a panel. All hands on deck, anchoring Moldova firmly in the West. And it's my honor to invite here the ambassador of the Republic of Moldova to the US and Mexico, Mr. Viorel Wurso, that will um, have a conversation and will conduct the Q&A for the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Moldova, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Mihai Povshoi. Please, you, you can come on stage. Both, you can come here and then both of you on stage. It's for you. Sure. Hi, I, uh, I think I know everyone. Uh, just to say, uh, welcome to Washington, and um, it's been now 20, mo uh, 20 months that I'm in this position, not that I'm counting, uh, but it's my third mark, and I'm ready to break a record, though I found out that a colleague of mine, Carolina Peribino, is here, uh, she attended four marks, uh, and she was the one also engaged in organizing the first mark together with uh, Elena Dragelin. Um, what I learned, Mark, is a lot about, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, especially the last day, I like when people finally relax. But it's also about building bridges between government in Moldova, government administration in the US and the diaspora. And I think that role is really important to bring officials, and thank you for engaging us in this conversation, because it's an opportunity to tell uh, the officials what we do back home, what are our needs, what are our challenges, what are our plans, but it's also an opportunity for diaspora to hold officials to account how they deliver, what they deliver, where they under-deliver, and also to brainstorm what are the ideas that they might go back home and implement. In the last two years, or the 20 months that I've been here, the, 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 prime, the, the biggest priorities was to secure our energy independence. And you heard a lot how much support we've been uh, receiving, especially from the US, to, to, to get it to the point where we can, we can say that 
We are not buying anymore the Russian gas and we are able to get on the European markets and boosting our security, overall security and defense. And again, this is a focus of our cooperation has been with the US administration for the last two years. And again, we, we received a lot of the support. But looking forward, and especially in my functions for the next two years, we, we, we are very grateful for the assistance that we are receiving. A lot of it is, is these are grants that it's quite um, exceptional. But you also cannot build uh, a sustainable economic development just on, on grants. And I think the, the, there is one ingredient that we really need to boost, and these are the investments. Uh, and this will be the focus of our uh, relationship. This is a lot what we've been also addressing and discussing, including with the USAID and the DFC today. As you just heard, uh, Minister of Energy Particle was here. We are about to announce very soon new tendering, international tendering for uh, renewables. And again, we are, we are looking forward that maybe some of those investors, if they need political risk insurance, that's something that DFC, for instance, can, can provide. So investment is, 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 is the new priority we need to focus. And I'm looking forward to the conversations tomorrow where we'll be discussing that. And the other big task is the elections. And this is also the functions of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the embassies, including here, is to make sure that everybody who wants to vote will have the opportunity to vote. And that's the reason that uh, hopefully the parliament will provide that opportunity also to vote by, by mail. Uh, yeah, that's it, and I really want to invite Minister on the on the podium and uh, maybe a few remarks, and then that I really we still have time for a few uh, questions, so be ready. Uh, there will be more time tomorrow, uh, but we'll have time also today. Please. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, as our friends from the United States have laid out so eloquently before, the support of the United States and the support of our partners in the European Union has allowed the Republic of Moldova to be now in a position a lot stronger, a lot more resilient than it was two years ago. It may be difficult to believe, but this is exactly the case. Moldova is no longer dependent on the energy resources from Gazprom, even though two, three years ago it felt like there is this umbilical cord connecting Moldova and Gazprom, and it felt for many of us back home that there is absolutely no other source of energy other than Gazprom. It turns out there is, and it turns out there are plenty. And just the other day, Moldova bought 30 million cubic meters for the first time of American LNG at a lower price than what Gazprom was offering. And in the next few days, we'll be buying a new tranche of, of gas at a price that is, again, lower than what the Gazprom was offering. And this was possible due to the enormous support of our friends from the United States government, allowing and helping us to diversify our energy supply. We are working now on diversifying our supply of electricity, so we are no longer dependent on the Kuchurgan power plant in the Transnistrian region of Moldova. And we are working on building capacity in our defense sector, in our police, in our intelligence, to make sure that we can combat the threats that come our way. And this has all been possible in an incredibly challenging time, when it felt like the sky was falling, when it felt like the economic situation was, was destroying our future. But it turns out, despite these enormous, enormous challenges, if the society is truly united, if we close our ranks, and we work together, hand in hand, we can achieve remarkable solutions. And that is also true, not just in the energy sector. That is also true in the reform of the justice system in Moldova. Yes, the path is difficult. Yes, we would like to see the reforms deliver a lot faster. But these are the sort of transformations that cannot happen overnight. When for 30 years, and quite frankly a lot before, we have had a system where Judges and politicians and prosecutors were hand in hand, one hand washing the other, covering for each other's crimes. Now to reform this system and to induce this sense of integrity-driven public services, be it prosecution, be it judiciary, be it many other services that, that the government provides, 
it's very difficult to employ this transformation in a speedy way. But as our friends in Brussels are encouraging us, and quite frankly, as our citizens are demanding, that we make sure that we deliver quality over speed. You know, as a politician, we are quite eager to see results fast because we are judged by our results by our voters. But as a citizen, I resonate with this notion of quality over speed because especially in the justice reform, we cannot afford to under-deliver because the undoing of this reform will be the undoing of our future. No country, not least the Republic of Moldova, can have a sense of future economic stability and prosperity without a properly functioning judiciary. And many of you are uh, prominent pro people in the business sector. You know full well that where there is clear enforcement of contracts, where you know that you'll receive justice in courts and you won't end up in a bidding contest or who pays more to win, that is not a future that is sustainable when it comes from a business perspective or quite frankly for, for, for the comfort of, of average citizen. So this is the fundamental effort and the fundamental commitment that we have now to deliver on justice reform. And yes, it's difficult. Yes, we wish the results would be here faster, but we cannot afford to rush things, to speed things up, with the risk of having this reform turn out like many others that we've had in our country before. Half measures, and more often than not, things that are just form with little function, we cannot afford to engage in those sort of practices that we've had before. So, in justice reform, things are progressing. The Supreme Council of Magistracy is vetted. The Supreme Council of Prosecutors, now the vetting is ongoing in the Supreme Court. Yes, it's a difficult process, and you see daily attempts back home to try to undermine the system, to sabotage, to discredit the vetting commission, to discredit uh, important leaders in the justice system and attacks, including on our good friend and, and, and a, a prominent representative of Moldovan diaspora who chose to come back home to, to work hard to, to deliver on these uh, promises that we've made to, to, to our citizens. But we will not be deterred because we know that the future of Moldova rests on justice reform as much as it rests on the uh, energy security of the country, on informational security of the country because only those circumstances can create the fertile ground that we so much need for economic development. So my message to you is first and foremost, thank you for being there for the Republic of Moldova. Thank you for supporting this convention, among other things that I'm sure you, you are uh, helping. And as uh, Samantha Power uh, just a few minutes ago so eloquently advocated on behalf of the Moldovan government when it comes to the elections in October. It's difficult to, to uh, I would do the eloquence and the, the uh, shared sense of importance of this election, but, but I will try. I, I, have a, I have a mandate and a responsibility to do that. Now, as you well know, we're trying to implement for the first time the uh, vote by mail in the Republic of Moldova for the, uh, the uh, United States and, and Canada, although there are ideas to, to expand it to a few other countries, but our capacity currently are quite limited. I personally would, ra would rather prefer to focus on fewer countries but deliver quality uh, elections than to spread out and to, to risk our resources that are, that are very thin. But this will be the opportunity for every single one of you and for many, many of your friends and colleagues and acquaintances, because nobody will have an excuse now to say that they couldn't vote because it was too difficult, it was too expensive. Now we have this opportunity in place with, with the votes by mail, and that will be a chance for every single Moldovan in US and Canada to be able to chip in into the future of Moldova. I cannot emphasize enough how consequential this election in October is. Not just the presidential election, but also the constitutional referendum on EU accession. The future of our country rests on the outcome of this election because we've seen not so far ago in our recent history where the country was isolated politically, 
where our economic outlook was very grim, where we didn't have partners in the international community. Now we, ho we have all that, and it's our responsibility to, to be able to build on that strong foundation. And just like we uh, celebrated recently uh, the 25th anniversary of our partnership with North Carolina, and I see here uh, 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 Congresswoman Ross, a good friend of the Republic of Moldova. <laughs> this cooperation that we have with North Carolina is truly remarkable. 25 years is a testament to this great partnership, but so is the 10 years of the Moldova, Moldovan American Convention. 10 years is a significant period of time, and the commitment that uh, Madame Dragalin has showed to building these ties between the United States and the Republic of Moldova, and to making sure that the Moldovan diaspora, the vibrant Moldovan diaspora in the United States, remains as connected, as involved, as part and parcel of the Moldovan society as it's humanly possible. So I'd like to commend Madame Dragolin for her effort on behalf of the Moldovan people for this, for your generosity, with your time, with your effort. This is an achievement to have such a strong commitment for such a long period of time, and we cannot thank you enough for, for, for your generosity and, and your time. It goes without saying that it's Madame Dragolin and the team. Individuals, uh, are, no matter how good leaders they are, without teams, and I should know because we have a political party uh, behind. It's not just myself, Madam President Sandu, uh, or uh, my colleagues. It's the every single member that chips in that is important. So truly, thank you and, and the entire team. This is exactly the time for questions. <laughs> We will have to Today leave. Yeah, we will have to leave a bit earlier, but maybe tomorrow. Then we'll tomorrow have. Tomorrow we're going to have. Yeah, we're going to have time for more questions. As I mentioned before, uh, there are busy times on the hill, so we have to adjust to what's happening live right now. Very big moment in uh, history. Thank you very much, yeah. Ambassador. Um, just when I thought that I can get more relaxed and um, I adjusted to the audience and um, I don't have to be nervous, I am nervous again because we have here <laughs> very distinguished guests that um, joined us. Um, we have uh, Congressman Lawler that uh, is the member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the co-chair of Congressional Moldova Caucus, and also Congresswoman Deborah Ross, U.S. Congress, co-chair of Congressional Moldova Caucus. Um, I would like, I believe, Congressman, <laughs> or if you want, if you want, you can both go on stage and just have, uh, have the time. <clears throat> How you prefer, please. Okay. And it depends on the time. So I'm going to go first. And um, we, I have some prepared remarks, but of course we want to hear from you and any questions you might have of us. So I'm so honored to be with all of you this afternoon for the 10th annual Moldovan American Convention. And thank you to the organizers of this event and the Embassy of Moldova for graciously hosting us. I'm equally thankful to be working closely with my colleague, Representative Mike Lawler, as the co-chairs of the Congressional Moldova Caucus, working together to strengthen the U.S.-Moldova relationship. 
As you've heard, and many of you know firsthand, my home state of North Carolina has enjoyed a strong and unwavering bond with Moldova dating back to 1999. Moldova has been paired with North Carolina in the Department of Defense's National Guard State Partnership Program for more than a quarter of a century. We also have several other partnerships with Moldova, and I've met with delegations who are working with our School of Government, working with the medical community, working with the agricultural community, and of course, your fabulous ambassador has been to North Carolina several times to represent Moldova. As members of the Congressional Moldova Caucus, my colleagues and I are working diligently to bolster support for the country as it navigates a complex set of challenges. And as you all know, Moldova gained independence in 1991, but since then it has faced continuous threats, first from the Soviet Union, now from Russia, and the threats have only been exacerbated by Russia's unprovoked, unconscionable invasion of Ukraine more than two years ago. Moldova has also faced significant economic challenges, but you are doing so much better. And in, in 2023, Representative Lawler and I led a letter with support from 11 of our colleagues on the, in the caucus urging Secretary Blinken and the State Department to continue expressing support for Moldova's EU candidacy. As you know, Moldova applied for EU membership and was granted candidate status in June of 2022. By December of 2023, the European Council decided to open accession negotiations, and this important development is a moment to celebrate, but of course, there's still more work to be done. Now more than ever, the EU represents a shining beacon of democracy in the face of Vladimir Putin's aggression and offers critical support for countries seeking peace and economic security in Europe. I will continue to do all that I can to help Moldova reach EU membership, and I know Representative Lawler is doing exactly the same thing. In order to support Moldova's defense needs, Congressman Lawler and I also proposed an amendment to Congress's annual defense authorization bill that would bolster Moldovan's defense modernization with the assistance of the United States. Today, President Sandu is working tirelessly to ensure Moldova stays on the path of freedom and democracy. With Putin continuing to threaten the peace and democracy in Europe and Moldova on the front lines of that, the United States has an important responsibility to continue supporting the Sandu administration at this very precarious moment. Safeguarding Moldova's precious democratic institutions is imperative to help secure a more peaceful and prosperous future for the Moldovan people. Please know that I will continue to be your ally in Congress. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the continued discussion. Well, thank you uh, to my colleague, uh, Deb Ross from North Carolina, uh, my co-chair as uh, part of the Moldova caucus. Uh, and it's really been great to work with her uh, to advance the Moldovan-American relationship. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Elena Dragolin for uh, organizing and hosting uh, this event uh, and working closely with my staff over the last many months to help secure this location and uh, really uh, put the event together. And so thank you to my staff uh, as well uh, for, uh, for working with Elena on this. Um, Buna ziwa. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, as many of you know, uh, my wife, uh, Doina, is from Moldova. Uh, she's here today along with our daughter, Juliana Elena, who uh, is two today. Today is her birthday. Uh, 
Mikuza Frumoshika, Juliana. But uh, it's great to be here uh, with all of you. This, obviously, on a personal level, uh, the relationship between Moldova and America uh, is important. Uh, but it's also extremely important uh, from a, a global and strategic uh, standpoint as well. Uh, and when we look at what has happened over the last two plus years uh, in Eastern Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what we're seeing uh, in the Middle East with the terrorist attack on Israel and the threats emanating in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the world is in the most precarious place since World War II. Uh, and it is critically important that the United States, uh, that Europe, uh, continue to lead the free world and that we work together to strengthen those relationships. And that's why uh, President Sandu's efforts uh, to get Moldova uh, into uh, the European Union uh, is critical. Uh, it's why we, along with our NATO allies, uh, continue to focus our efforts uh, on uh, peace and stability and uh, from a national security standpoint, uh, military cooperation. You are here at a, a very unique moment uh, in American history. Uh, this is a moment uh, for leadership. It is a moment uh, to show the world that America still has the resolve to lead. Uh, and tomorrow, we will vote on a supplemental aid package that will provide uh, over $100 billion in aid uh, to Israel, to Ukraine, and to Taiwan. Uh, it will inclu include key provisions uh, that will take on our adversaries, from Russia to Iran to China. Uh, and so celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Moldovan American Convention uh, is in Washington, D.C., uh, you are here at a critical juncture. My objective as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, as a member of the Financial Services Committee, uh, has been to focus on the substantive and serious policy issues uh, that are facing the United States, that are facing uh, Western democracy and how we strengthen uh, the relationships between the U.S. and our allies. And so uh, providing Ukraine with the lethal aid that they need to defend themselves and to fight back against Russian aggression is critical. My concern has been from the very beginning, if Ukraine falls, uh, Moldova and other former Soviet satellite states will fall with it. And that is unacceptable uh, to me, it's unacceptable to the United States, it's unacceptable to Europe, and I know unacceptable to all of you in this room. And so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, passing this aid package tomorrow is just the beginning. Um, but when you see the threats that are emanating and the coordinated effort between China, Russia, and Iran to undermine and destabilize the free world, uh, this is why we are doing the work that we're doing in Congress. Uh, this is why uh, we are focused like a laser on supporting our allies. Uh, and I consider Moldova an ally. I consider uh, the relationship between the United States and Moldova of strategic importance uh, and a relationship that we want to continue to foster and grow uh, economically. Uh, from a national security standpoint, from an energy standpoint. I was heartened to hear uh, yesterday when we met with the foreign minister about the purchase of uh, U.S. liquid natural gas uh, and how we are going to continue to build that relationship. Energy is critical. And if we can uh, isolate Russia and isolate Iran uh, and their illicit energy uh, and oil trade, uh, then we can weaken their economies, we can weaken their militaries, uh, and we can strengthen uh, democracy across the globe. And that, to me, is of critical importance. And I want to thank both of our ambassadors 
uh, for the great work that they do on behalf of the United States and Moldova, uh, building this relationship uh, and, and really working cohesively uh, to strengthen uh, the work that we're doing together. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, we're happy to take any questions, comments, or insults anyone may have. Now I want to see how nervous you are to have the microphone. So please, um, questions. Anyone? Oh. Your name first and then the question. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. My name is Vitaly. I, um, I uh, currently reside in Detroit, Michigan. Um, thanks for being here. I know it's like everybody said, it's really busy. The question I have is, many of us come outside of North Carolina or New York, how can we influence our representatives, be it congressmen, senators, uh, even on the state level, how can we influence the decisions and the votes uh, that you're going to making decisions like you will be taking one tomorrow? Is it writing letters? Is it calling? I think it'd be helpful for everyone here to learn more about this. So Mold Moldova obviously is a, a, a country of roughly four million people, half of which reside outside of the country in rough numbers, um, predominantly in Romania, Italy, Germany. Uh, but we have a sizable uh, diaspora here in the United States. Uh, and I think uh, Deb and I have tried to, to work together to raise awareness to many of our colleagues uh, about the importance of Moldova. Um, they're starting to hear about the wine, and uh, which is good. Uh, exactly. Um, but they're, they're getting, especially because of the, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, they're, they're understanding a greater, uh, of, of greater import how uh, Moldova impacts the situation in the region. Um, and so I think that obviously from you know, our perspective, getting them to understand the importance is, is key. Deb has a connection between because of North Carolina's relationship. I have the connection because obviously my wife. But um, I think what's key is for the Moldovan community in each of these areas, whether it's Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, or, or any district in the country, to really go meet with your representatives, reach out to their office, ask for a meeting with their staff, whether here in Washington or in district, uh, and give them some information on Moldova from your perspective, uh, but the importance of, of uh, the relationship, uh, getting people to understand Transnistria, for instance, uh, I think is important because a lot of the folks don't necessarily understand that, okay, well, there's, it's a breakaway region of Moldova or that Russia has forces there. Or, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues are wondering, well, why hasn't Russia... Uh, use that as a, a, a launching pad uh, within the war in Ukraine. Um, and frankly, the fact that Moldova has taken in more Ukrainian refugees per capita than anywhere else in the globe. Uh, and how grateful we are for, for Moldova to do that. Uh, and so I think there's a, a, you know, a lot that can be done. And frankly, in addition, you know, Moldovans and Romanians teaming up because uh, there is more strength in numbers. Um, and, and obviously because of the close relationship between the two countries uh, and, and the identity uh, with Romania in so many ways, culturally, uh, economically, uh, to, to really f forge a path forward. So the biggest thing is to reach out to your members. You can write to them. You can you know, reach out to them on social media. You can ask for a meeting with their uh, with them or their staff uh, and really engage them on the issue? Um, well, I, I'll just echo um, what Congressman Lawler said, but the other thing is Moldova is having a moment internationally right now. And I think it's very important to pair up um, with your Ukrainian, with Ukrainian groups in your areas. It was kind of funny um, when we were having our celebration uh, in advance of the 25th anniversary of, of North Carolina's relationship with Moldova, 
there were maybe about 200 people from all over North Carolina who came together um, to talk about their experiences with Moldova, sometimes even like a, an elementary school teacher who went over to Moldova um, and stayed there through most of the pandemic was there to talk about her experience. And afterwards, some um, Ukrainian Americans came up to me, they were there and they said, boy, how could we get something like this for Ukraine? Um, now, of course, this was North Carolina where, where um, you know, we have this relationship and this has been cultivated for, you know, more than two decades, but you can, piggyback on things that are going on um, with the Ukrainians and, and educate people about Moldova, educate people about um, what you have done to help Ukraine. And, um, and then I'll kind of give you a little context for some of these international issues. Um, Congressman Lawler and I have um, dealt with, you know, kind of the both sides of um, what's going on in Gaza. Um, you know, there are protesters, there are rallies. Um, one thing about every Ukraine rally and every Moldova um, conference that I've been to, everybody's of the same accord. And um, Elected officials like to go places <laughs> where they're welcome and they can be educated and they feel like they can make a difference. And you letting these elected officials know they can make a difference for Moldova by getting more money through USAID, by making sure that we provide security assistance, and by making sure that we protect Ukraine. And um, elected officials always like to get on the bandwagon with people who are grateful, who um, work hard for themselves, and who invite them to learn about how um, they can be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, so I'll be a little bit helper here, yeah, with the microphone. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Rob Monyak. I'm uh, deputy CEO of the Trans Oil Group, which is one of the largest companies in Moldova. It's the large agribusiness. By the way, um, I did have an opportunity recently to spend some time with a visiting delegation from North Carolina, set, headed by uh, Secretary of State Marshall. So it's amazing the work they've been able to do. But anyway, my question is about you touched on uh, Transnistria, and you also mentioned Moldova's having a moment. I was wondering, is just have your, uh, both of your thoughts as to whether this moment extends to an opportunity to resolve this 23-year conflict? And if so, what can the United States possibly be doing um, to encourage the resolution of that conflict? So I think from the standpoint of the region, obviously getting uh, the situation in Ukraine resolved uh, is of paramount importance. And I think if we can uh, begin to push back uh, on the Russian influence in the region, uh, that is critically important. Uh, and ultimately, if there is an opportunity in settling the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, getting uh, you know, terms of a negotiated settlement, I think the question is within the rest of the region, how, how can we take advantage of that moment? Um, I think, obviously, as, the, as Moldova continues down the path of uh, its EU candidacy and getting more westernized uh, in, in its government, in its economy, uh, in the relationships, uh, and other uh, formi former Soviet states in the region, I think there's real opportunity to see, um, see things grow. I also think... Part of it is putting a lot more uh, economic pressure on Russia out of this uh, as, as we work through this. And if we can begin to uh, wean everybody off of Russian uh, gas, if we can get people, get China out of the Iranian oil trade, if we can start to isolate these folks, um, I think it makes it easier to resolve some of these other conflicts in the area, whether it's with Transnistria or if you're looking at Armenia and Azerbaijan, for instance. Uh, 
the, the challenges with Russia uh, are that significant and getting, and getting their malign influence out of these regions and out of these areas is critical. So I do think there's opportunity. Do I think it's something that's going to be resolved, uh, you know, in the immediate? No. Do I think, you know, the fact that Transnistria has primarily stayed out of this conflict, I think is a good thing. It's a very good sign. Um, but, and, and the fact that Russia has not been able to use Transnistria as a launching pad into Ukraine is a good sign. But, um, you know, I think until you really have resolution in Ukraine, I think it's hard to, to get there on that. Um, I will just add a couple points to all of these points, which I agree with. One is the outcome of your, uh, of the elections coming up are going to be critical. So, will, will be critical. So the stronger that Moldova is democratically with the support of the vast majority of its people, the weaker Transnistria's influence and Russia's influence will be. And then the second thing, of course, is, you know, being part of the EU. Because once you have that economic security, that economic assistance, that's a real threat to Russia. And, um, you know, we've seen what one of the consequences of the lawless invasion of Ukraine is that NATO grew. And now we need the EU to grow too. And the more that it grows with countries like Moldova, the stronger Europe becomes and more of a bulwark that it is against Russian aggression. I agree with, with uh, everything Congresswoman Ross just said. I, I think that's critical. If you can, if you can see uh, Moldova continue down the path of the EU, continue down the path of democratic norms, rooting out the corruption within the government, uh, th that's critical. And that, I think, makes it a lot easier, ultimately, to resolve some of these tensions because Transnistria, at some point, is going to want to be part of that. And I'll just add one little thing. Sorry, I know somebody else. One of the things that North Carolina is doing, and this is something that Secretary of State Marshall has initiated um, because she's basically our ambassador uh, to Moldova from, from North Carolina, is that training of elected officials on how to be better at what they do and how to represent people and how to really foster democracy. And that's going on with the University of North Carolina School of Government. And the more that that can be done, um, not just with the government, but in the economic sphere, in the defense sphere, everywhere. And that's a way other states may be able to um, help support Moldova. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being so positive and for your support. Um, the last two years, uh, I'm, I'm Victoria. I represent the Moldova Project organization. I work in Moldova uh, with the poor families and uh, with the refugees as well. The last two years has been a hell for us uh, in all of perspectives of what a war means. Um, but since the war in Gaza started, the the Things have, have switched from lots of help that came to Moldova to very little help. So today, um, I can feel like there is not so much help coming to Moldova, and obviously I understand why. But when we speak about Moldova, that we have so many elderly people and so many poor families, I'm just wondering how are we supposed to keep going and just rolling the, the ball? Because it feels like, of course, there's lots of many positive things happening, but it's just working with so many uh, poor people and people who cannot afford to have a life in Moldova. I'm just wondering how can we survive through these so very challenging times? Um, yeah, just give me your thoughts. How can we survive? Thank you. Well, first of all, um, the Moldovan people have so much respect for your ability to um, resist and your generosity for taking in 
all of these Ukrainian refugees. Um, and so we have been advocating for increased aid from the United States. I think that that aid, though, has to be um, multinational, including from Europe, and Europe knows that Moldova is on the line, and from other allies. Um, and, you know, we are facing all these things all around the world. I was recently in South Korea. The first thing that people asked was, is the United States going to abandon South Korea because of everything else that's going on? And, you know, there's a DMZ, a demilitarized zone in South Korea, and I went there. And the fact that the South Koreans are concerned. So when we're being stretched in all these different ways, the most important thing for us to do is continue to fund people who are part of democracy, freedom, economic security, and that's what we will be voting on tomorrow in a very bipartisan way, and to increase the sphere of people who will contribute. Because the United States, again, we, we're going to put a whole lot of money in a whole lot of places tomorrow, but we need to expand our reach. Um, and I will tell you, I'm also co-chair of um, the Congressional Study Group on Europe, um, and the pride that you are now seeing from countries like Finland and Sweden to be part of NATO, be part of the solution, the increased defense budgets, everybody has got to pitch in. And um, the world hasn't had to see this kind of sacrifice among Western democracies since World War II, um, but that's something that we have to be prepared to do for the good of the world and also because we have got to repel Putin and this evil. And just to, to add on to what Congresswoman Ross is saying, the United States uh, has and continues uh, to support our allies. Uh, we have lots of challenges here in the United States that we have to deal with, including our own southern border and sovereignty, as well as uh, a lot of people who are experiencing economic hardship uh, here as well. Um, but I think my general view is that we are the leader of the free world and we have an obligation to continue to lead. In the absence of leadership, uh, there will be a void and that void will be filled by nefarious actors. Uh, and so, you know, tomorrow's bill uh, is, uh, you know, but a first step. I think we need to continue to work uh, between the United States and Moldova, our ambassadors, as well as our uh, parliamentarians, our members of Congress, uh, and uh, President Sandu uh, and the President of the United States to really make sure that we are trying to address the challenges um, and, and build the partnership. Uh, because I do think there are things that the U.S. can invest in Moldova uh, to support it, to help it, uh, and to strengthen the economic relationships not just with the U.S., but with Europe. Uh, as, obviously, as the EU candidacy uh, continues down the path, that will help tremendously. Um, I think Romania can play a, a critical role in continuing to advocate for Moldova. Um, but there are, there are a lot of opportunities ahead. Uh, it's going to take time. It's not going to be resolved overnight. Uh, but uh, it is something where I, I do think the relationship can continue to strengthen and we can find ways to be more helpful economically uh, as well. And I think, you know, just when you look at some of the things that have been done working with the U.S. to root out corruption, to put sanctions in place on some of the oligarchs, uh, you know, and, and uh, their funds that flow through the U.S., uh, as well as, uh, you know, trade possibilities, especially with Moldova's wine industry. Um, and again, this is also where the diaspora here in the United States can play an important role, getting more engaged with your, uh, your federal and state officials uh, in your community, organizing you know, more of an effort. The, the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I mean, that's the reality. And uh, the communities that are best organized 
uh, get in front of uh, their elected leadership and force their elected leadership to take them seriously um, because they are a block and they work together and they, and they make noise about the issues that matter. So that's part of it. Uh, and, and the diaspora can play a critical role as well. Hello, uh, my name is Valeriu Pasha. I represent here a CSO based in Moldova. It's called Watchdog Community Think Tank. And you just mentioned uh, the uh, sanctions on uh, oligarchs. Uh, an important part of our work is monitoring and countering Russian disinformation. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in this uh, regard in recent seven to ten months is sponsored toxic propaganda on social media, especially meta-controlled uh, platforms, Facebook and Instagram. So in, during the recent local elections, just one fugitive oligarch, Ilan Shore, sponsored by Moscow, fueled something like $200,000 in sponsored posts on Facebook only in Moldova. This is like enormous money for uh, social media marketing in such a small country. We have up to 1.2 million uh, active users. He's under sanctions. There are other people under sanctions, for example, other fugitive oligarch, Vyacheslav Platon, who is being sanctioned by Canada, also uh, spends tens of thousands of dollars every month uh, to promote uh, toxic Russian narratives. In this condition, it's really hard to achieve any tangible results in our work, and it almost uh, you know, annihilates all the efforts, for example, of USA to support independent media or to support the work of organizations like ours. And we have crucial elections ahead. So if they were spending hundreds of thousands every month for local elections, which are not that important, uh, we can imagine just how much Russia will pay for all this all online propaganda during presidential and uh, and elections and referendum we have this year, and especially parliamentary elections next year. So, from our experience, uh, uh, Meta is very much non-responsive. They don't want to take any actions. They even do not respond to the official requests of our legal authorities, which are making investigations of illegal funding of campaigns. So, these companies, especially Meta, much uh, to a much smaller degree, uh, uh, Google with YouTube platform, they still work now as enablers of Russian influence. Both are American campaigns. So isn't it possible to deal anyhow with that? Mm -hmm. So this is obviously something we're seeing uh, even here in the United States uh, and concern about how social media uh, platforms can be utilized to interfere uh, with elections, how they can be utilized uh, to, uh, you know, uh, promote propaganda. Um, and it's part of the reason why in this bill tomorrow we're going to be banning TikTok, basically, by forcing a sale uh, from China, uh, from a Chinese company, uh, to someone other than a Chinese company. Uh, otherwise, within a year, they will be banned in the United States. Um, and so I think part of it, and you know, I, I met yesterday with Veronica Dragolin, uh, the chief of the anti-corruption uh, prosecutor's office, and part of it is in Moldova, making sure that the laws uh, are adopted that need to be adopted with respect to uh, some of the influence and uh, how it can be uh, u utilized uh, and force these companies to operate within the law of Moldova. Uh, secondarily, uh, obviously, being able to trace uh, and prosecute uh, foreign funds that are used uh, in elections. Uh, I have talked previously with the ambassador uh, of Israel to the United States about Elon Shore. Uh, and the need for him to be um, uh, brought back to Moldova, extradited to Moldova. 
Um, and, you know, I think we need to continue to put pressure there. Obviously, Israel is a little uh, occupied at the moment. But the objective is, is really to make sure that these individuals, uh, these oligarchs that have used their wealth and their influence uh, to uh, engage in corruption in Moldova or interfere in elections are held accountable. I think in the United States, we certainly can work and work with the ambassador uh, and uh, Ambassador Ursu to try and hold Meta accountable uh, and these social media platforms and make sure that they are doing everything they can to limit the ability to interfere. Um, I, I'll just answer um, because I think Congressman Lawler has covered the kind of social media aspect of this, but I'll answer about winning elections and influencing elections. The most effective way to, to win people's hearts and minds and win an election is not necessarily through media or social media. It's through direct contact with people who you know and trust. And we absolutely need to find more ways to tamp down disinformation, corruption, hold um, corporations accountable, absolutely. But the best antidote to that is person-to-person -person trusted communication in community settings. And one of the reasons why disinformation is so effective is because people are spending more time alone with their social media and their devices and less time in community, in churches, in um, at work with, with people who they know, talking to their families. So while we deal with the corruption and the disinformation, let's redouble, triple, quadruple our person-to-person -person direct contact in order to get the right people elected and get those messages out. Um, so I just want to put that on the table. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, it was very difficult to do that because of the health concerns. But right now, what I'm talking about in our elections coming up, where the same kinds of things are going on, is being out in community, sharing, caring, and influencing people who are close to you. My name is Jon Sturza, I'm 99, I was Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova and signed this agreement with North Carolina. And I remember this time, it was a great time. Uh, first military uh, exercise, first uh, exchange of uh, real people. And behind of these ideas was, you know, United States and Moldova is two different in size countries. It's very difficult. Of course, we can maintain, maintain formal relations between two states, but it was idea it was to have a relation with smaller enti entity in the United States. And I think today results, it's a great example of how we can build this relation between small country and some region in America. And once again, thank you very much for people of North Carolina for the contribution. Thank you. More questions? Thank you very much for being here, Sergio Kierman from Miami. Do you, uh, do you believe that some occupied territories of Ukraine are becoming or on their way to become a frozen conflict, not unlike uh, Transnistria? And uh, do you have a sense that a slow Moldovan military modernization stays in the way of Moldova's resolving the Transnistrian issue? So, uh, I think it is 
Hard to say at the moment uh, with respect to Ukraine. Uh, obviously, the objective uh, is to uh, have a positive resolution uh, for Ukraine. Um, my concern, uh, certainly, if you look at, obviously, the Russian uh, annexation of Crimea uh, in 2014, uh, is that there will continue to be some uh, Russian presence, uh, even in a negotiated settlement. Uh, and so, you know, the objective to me is to make sure that Ukraine is in the strongest possible position, which is why they need the lethal aid, uh, to uh, ultimately have some type of negotiated settlement, uh, barring Putin waking up and realizing that he's been wrong all this time. Um, which, given his track record over 25 years, is unlikely. Um, so, you know, I, I, I am certainly concerned of this being some type of prolonged affair. Um, I think, the, you know, from my vantage point and that of many of my colleagues, the administration, our administration, needs to be working towards a resolution here um, as, as we provide the lethal aid uh, that, you know, brings this conflict uh, to, to an end um, and, you know, keeps Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, so that's, that, I think, is critically important. Um, you know, with respect to Transnistria, like I said before, I think at the moment I, I don't see much changing there. I, I think the, the question really is once we get resolution in Ukraine, what does that look like and how does that impact the rest of, of the region? Uh, and, and then I think it'll be easier to figure out how to get resolution with Transnistria going forward. Um, the only thing I would add to that, uh, because I think there was an aspect of your question that had to deal with um, how Moldova defends itself um, and whether it should build up its defense capabilities. Obviously, uh, North Carolina has the relationship with the National Guard, and um, you know, there's no uh, th the best offense is a good defense, and so I would say that deterrence, which has been pretty much the uh, policy of the United States with respect to with respect to Russia and with respect to Vladimir Putin. Um, is something he understands. Um, and so I wouldn't ever suggest doing something offensively, but doing something defensively that makes, um, makes Moldova less um, of what would be considered an easy target um, is um, always a good idea. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Ross, Congressman Lawler, thank you very much for joining us today. Also for your hard work in um, Moldova Caucus in Congress and for your hard work on the Hill. We are all waiting for your vote tomorrow. Uh, good luck to you, good luck to us, all of us. And thank you very much for joining us. We're very honored. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a short break, um, 15 minutes break. Um, communicate, enjoy this wonderful room. Uh, admire the ceiling. These are 19th century hand painted silk goblins. Um, enjoy the 15 minutes, and we expect you to be here at uh, 3 p.m. Thank you. Uh, the life is going to go on. Enjoy. Okay, let's start the second part of uh, the town hall meeting. And uh, it is uh, my honor to greet and ask to join us here on stage, the Ambassador Eric McKee, Assistant Administrator for the Europe and Eurasia Bureau USA, and, um, 
Thank you. Thank you. And Ambassador Logston, everyone knows him here, the Ambassador of the US to Moldova. Please, Ambassador. Bunaziwa. It's great to see everyone. I'm just delighted to be here today. I see so many familiar faces, both from North America and from Chisinau. Moldovan Americans, Moldovans based in Moldova, and of course, American friends of Moldova, all in one room. Thank you and congratulations to Elena Dragolin and their team <laughs> for organizing this fantastic convention. This program is filled with opportunities to hear from a range of wonderful speakers and to connect with each other on important topics. I'm also happy to be speaking again, again this year, alongside Aaron McKee, USAID AID Assistant Administrator, just as we did at last year's convention in Chicago, for those of you who were there. The United States governor, government is a proud partner of the Republic of Moldova, and Ambassador McKee and I are pleased for this opportunity to update you on the latest developments in our partnership. A lot has happened since the last MAC. Just a few short weeks after last year's convention, the European Moldova rally drew 80,000 Moldovans to National Assembly Square. I'll never forget the atmosphere of pride, optimism, and genuine joy in that crowd and excitement about what the future holds for Moldova. We were delighted when the European Council then voted to open accession negotiations with Moldova, reflecting the progress made in the very short time on key reforms. Some might joke about the irony of the Americans being the biggest champion for Moldova's European integration. The European Union ambassador gives me a very hard time about this. <laughs> but we see this as an easy one. The Moldovan people have made clear that their future is in the West, in the democratic world, and we see a bright future for Moldova in the European Union. This is, I'm sad to say, my last MAC convention as the US ambassador to Moldova. After an inspiring and humbling more than two years serving as ambassador, I'll be departing Moldova at the end of May. My wife Michelle and I have loved our time in the beautiful country of Moldova, filled with inspiring individuals, determined and working hard to build a better future for all Moldovans. The good thing is our relationship is a team effort and the entire US government is invested in supporting Moldovans to develop the country and further its European integration in the years to come. So know that I'll be following this very closely and as the Prime, Deputy Prime Minister told me today, you never actually leave Moldova, you just change your location. And I think that's very true for all of you. I said this last year, it remains even more true today. The US-Moldova relationship has never been stronger. Yesterday's high-level U.S.-Moldova strategic dialogue was an opportunity for us to celebrate the achievements of the past year and to further deepen our relationship by finding new avenues for partnership, solutions to problems, and of course, the best path forward. I'm continuously impressed by the progress Moldova is making, and the United States is proud to partner with both the people and the government of Moldova to help realize the goal of a more democratic, prosperous, and secure future for all Moldovans. I hope all of you heard that phrase from the DFC chairman, too. I was glad to hear it. To do this, over the course of our 32-year partnership, the United States has provided over $2.5 billion in assistance to Moldova. U.S. assistance address addresses both urgent and long-term long needs in Moldova and spans numerous sectors, including justice reform and strengthening democratic institutions, including sustainable independent media, support for refugees from Ukraine, and the communities hosting them, energy, high-value agriculture, tech and creative sectors, infrastructure development, border security, combating trafficking in persons, cybersecurity, countering disinformation, and military professionalization. This support has included direct budget assistance, training and technical assistance, equipment and software, exchange programs, and diplomatic and civil society engagement. I think it's safe to say that U.S. assistance is still continues to make a tangible difference. Let me just give a few examples of how the support is improving lives. Our support to Moldova's cultural heritage preservation is one important line of effort. And last month, President Sandu 
Minister of Culture Prodan, and I celebrated the completion of the $1 million restoration of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary Church in Kaohsiung. I hope all of you will visit. It's truly remarkable. And last year, we also announced a $200,000 grant to the National Jewish History Museum to preserve the Bet Kaddishim, the funerary hall, within the Chisinau Jewish Cemetery. Both of these projects were funded through the Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation, and they're preserving important historical and cultural places for future generations of Moldovans and lots of visitors to see and experience. Since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the United States has provided $118 million in humanitarian assistance to Moldova, and last year alone, this totaled just under $43 million. And these funds support the approximately 115,000 people who were forced to leave the violence in Ukraine who are seeking refuge in Moldova, along with the Moldovan communities that welcomed them. We provided hospital and medical equipment, medicine, supplies, ambulances, and school renovations that will benefit not only Ukrainian refugees, but also Moldovans now and for years to come. Russia's brutal war of aggression in Ukraine has deepened conversations about defense and about what it means to be able to defend Moldova's constitutional neutrality. The Moldovan government has increased its defense budget considerably in the past two years and also approved a new national security strategy that names Russia and anti-corruption as the main threats to Moldova's security. The United States has provided over $45 million worth of foreign military assistance in the last year and another $36 million worth of humanitarian assistance through our defense partnership since 1994. And this year we marked 30 years of defense partnership. Our government is working to help modernize Moldova's army, making sure it is well equipped and modern with the resources to perform its role. The United States will also continue to support the Moldovan government's efforts to modernize its security forces. We conducted several bilateral large joint exercises over the past year including the annual fire shield exercise, the airborne exercise, our ex-partner, and the largest military training exercise conducted between the United States and Moldova, Rapid Trident. I can't tell you the thrill to stand in the center of Moldova near Markalesht and watch American and Moldovan paratroopers jumping out of a NATO-operated aircraft onto a field. It was truly something to see I don't know if I can say anything else, Congresswoman Ross is gone, but the importance of the North Carolina-Moldova relationship. Uh, we have a bilateral affairs officer from North Carolina. We've had one in the embassy since 1996. And Moldova's 22nd Peacekeeping Battalion even placed second in the North Carolina National Guard's Best Warrior Competition. Moldova's first time participating in this five-day endurance and skill competition, and they came in second. North Carolina and Moldova also received the 2024 award as the State Partnership of the Year. That was just last weekend. Secretary of State Marshall was in Las Vegas to help receive that award along with the Adjutant General. This underscores the value that the entire United States sees in the partnership. And of course, as you've heard, if you haven't seen all the great photos, we had Secretary of State Elaine Marshall from North Carolina. She was in Moldova last month to sign another five-year extension of the partnership agreement between the Republic of Moldova and the state of North Carolina. And thanks to her leadership and that of our dedicated Moldovan counterparts, we have one of the most amazing civilian partnership programs that I have ever seen. I'm not surprised the Ukrainians asked if they could have one too. North Carolinians have supported a nursing program, a dental partnership, a humanitarian assistance program for all schools around Moldova. In December, Under Secretary of State Azra Zaya came to Moldova to announce the United States' largest single security sector investment ever in Moldova. And that's going to expand Moldova's existing law enforcement communication network across the whole country. This will ensure that Moldovan authorities have the most effective, reliable, and secure communications capabilities as they work to secure Moldova's border and protect citizens. As some of you may remember, when the war began in 2022, Moldovan security officials were using their cell phones. So this will help them have a reliable and secure way to communicate. 
The Export Control and Border Security Program has been an essential partner in supporting Moldova's sovereignty through border security improvements, and our work supporting the civilian security sector helps Moldova better secure its borders. A chemical analyzer donated by Expis in October 2023 was already used, and they've seized over 16 kilograms of narcotics worth more than a million dollars. Our partnership in this area is also helping to develop and strengthen new sanctions legislation for Moldova. As Moldova faces a hybrid war, we're also working with the government to improve cyber infrastructure to repel cyber attacks. I'm sure Aaron will talk about this as well. CRDF Global, it's an American NGO, has done several cyber hygiene trainings across the Moldovan government. And they're working with STISC, the main uh, inf government uh, information agency, and the Ministry of Energy to support broader cyber needs, and signed, we also signed an agreement, an MOU, with the Ministry of Energy this, this year. Since January, the U.S. State Department has funded a cyber advisor to build cyber capacity and to harden defense within the Ministry of Defense. To address another element of Russia's attempts to attack Moldova's information space are, of course, our investments in independent media. We invest in independent media to promote, th promote their ability to serve as watchdogs and investigators into critical issues across the country. And truly independent media, I think we all know, is essential to democratic development. And Moldovan journalists are revealing corruption, carrying important messages, and exposing attempts of foreign malign influence. And that's all helping ensure that Moldovans have consistent access to reliable information. The embassy's public diplomacy section will continue its support of independent media, making sure that Moldovans have access to consistent, reliable information from credible sources. We're also supporting the Audiovisual Council's important efforts in keeping foreign malign influence off of Moldovan airwaves. In September, the State Department Special Envoy, Jamie Rubin, came to Moldova to sign another MOU on our partnership to counter foreign malign influence. And that partnership's involved unfolding in various ways, including through the development of Moldova's new Center for Strategic Communication and Countering Disinformation. I could go on all day the list of the partnership activities that we have. Our work in anti-corruption and justice sector programming by both the State Department as well as by USAID in partnership with the EU and the Dutch. It's continuing and moving into different stages, including ongoing work in the vetting commissions. We heard about that from the foreign minister. We have an advisor from the U.S. Treasury embedded at the State Tax Service. We have a whole team of advisors who are uh, providing support in various specialized tax areas helping Moldova modernize its tax collection system and harmonizing it with international standards. Another new player from the U.S. government, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They're providing specialized training and mentorship to Moldova's National Agency for Public Health and laboratories to increase epidemiological and public health emergency management capabilities. And let's not forget our people-to-people -people ties. Some of you may have come to the United States for the first time on a U.S. government-funded exchange. More than 6,000 Moldovans are our alumni. We're proud of the legacy of Moldovan leaders at all levels and in all sectors who participated in exchanges. Foreign Minister Papshoi, who you saw here, who's with us today, he's one of those leaders. He was a flex student. He still says he's from Moldova and Ohio, which we're proud of. From high school students to those firmly established in their careers, we know that these exchanges are invaluable experiences for all involved. And they also help us build greater understanding and knowledge between our two countries. And that's not even to mention the thousands of Americans who visited Moldova on exchange programs or come to Moldova to work as Peace Corps volunteers. We're very excited. Since I was last here, we have Peace Corps volunteers again in Moldova. Very excited. I was delighted to swear in our new volunteers in December, and we're eagerly awaiting another group who will begin their training in June. We hear frequently from Moldovan leaders and in communities across the country about the huge Im impact that one Peace Corps volunteer can and does make a difference in the personal and professional lives of all those people they work with. We're also engaging in partnership with AmCham Moldova to advocate for transparent business practices and a business environment that will increase investment and create jobs. We also work closely with U.S. companies in Moldova, those who want to be there, those we want to be there to make sure they know that Moldova is open for business. We signed an Open Skies Agreement, and the MOUs that Moldova signed with Amazon and Microsoft are great examples of our deepening partnership on this front. 
and the joint Moldova-Romanian American Chamber of Commerce Business Forum held in Chisinau in, Feb in February showcased investment and trade opportunities in Moldova. I think we had more than 50 companies represented. It was great. Special Representative for Ukraine's Economic Recovery, former Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker, was just in Moldova earlier this month, and she had a chance to talk with both Moldova's leadership as well as AmCham members about opportunities for investment and expansion in Moldova as we think about reconstruction in Ukraine. And of course, you all heard from Scott Nathan from, the defend, uh, from our Development Finance Corporation and their interest in engaging more in Moldova. We're ecstatic to be a partner in all of these efforts. So thank you for the opportunity to highlight some of the uh, highlights that we have here. I see every day progress that's being made. This is a critical moment for Moldova's development, and there's a lot on the line. So I hope all of you, as Administrator Power asks you to do, please look into investment and business opportunities in Moldova to help expand the trade between our two countries and continue to build Moldova's business sector. I think you'll find there are willing and capable partners in Moldova and our embassy is always ready to facilitate any kind of engagement you need. I don't need to encourage you all to get involved. You're all here. Uh, but please do stay involved and stay in touch with us. Um, it sounds funny, but please check out our social media pages. We're not only bad social media. There's good social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, on Instagram. And you'll see real-life, real-time updates on what we're doing, what the U.S. Embassy is doing in Chisinau to both advance our bilateral relationship and to help build a democratic, prosperous, and secure future for Moldova and all Moldovans. So now we're going to get to dig deeper into USAID. I'm going to turn the floor over to Ambassador McKee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ambassador Logson. Thank you for that great uh, both inventory and celebration of so much that has been accomplished in the last year. Yelena, thank you for inviting me to join the convention again. And congratulations on the 10th. That's, uh, that's amazing. A decade of identifying how the Moldovan di diaspora and Moldova can strengthen ties and, as you heard from my boss, Administrator Power today, mobilize investment in the future that we all know not only is important for Moldova's security and prosperity, but frankly will pay, I think, tremendous dividends, not just today, but in the future. This event demonstrates clear commitment of the Moldovan American diaspora community to foster and sustain as Ambassador Logsdon mentioned, the bonds, um, culture, business, and values that we share between the United States and Moldova. Like all of you in this room, USAID, my agency, the United States Agency for International Development, stands firm in its support for a democratic and prosperous Moldova. And we are proud, extraordinarily proud, to be Moldova's development partner of choice. Over the last three decades, USAID has partnered with the Moldovan people, and this partnership has contributed to opening new markets to Moldovan goods, building more competitive industries, strengthening local governance, and building a vibrant civil society. Our assistance has supported Moldova's path to the EU by helping bring Moldovan goods to market. Okay, we all know Moldovan wine. Okay, it's world class and it's probably the best. I'm from California, and so for me to say this is a big thing. Um, uh, but in addition to your world class amazing wine, uh, fruit products, fashion design, um, and so many other amazing, creative, and delicious offerings that Moldova has for the rest of the world are hitting the EU markets and beyond. Uh, further, Moldova has strengthened its energy security by increasing its energy connected connectivity to Europe. These connections, this diversified economic partnership, this opportunity to showcase for the world what Moldova is capable of is something that every single one of you in this room, and certainly the ambassador and I, are extraordinarily proud of. So everybody give your country a round of applause for a second. Okay. But despite recent progress, 
we know that Moldova is at a critical juncture as it sits on the front lines of Russia's aggression in the region. Together, and I mean that sincerely, together, we need to tackle new and complicated challenges. And I'm proud to say that Moldova and the United States have risen and will continue to rise to this occasion. To support Moldova's, uh, Moldova in a time of crisis directly stemming from Putin's unprovoked war in Ukraine, the US Congress approved funding to alleviate the high cost of energy imports, to increase domestic power generation, and to improve energy market connections to the EU, as I mentioned earlier. This is vital because one of the worst weapons that Putin wields is not the missiles and the drones or the disinformation, but it's the power and the leverage to erode a country's sovereignty and take away its choice about who it wants to do business with, where it wants to invest, and certainly where it can source and rely upon a steady, affordable energy supply. So we are all in on energy independence and, in, and energy security. In addition, not only do we see the importance of institutionalizing and, and building resilience in the energy sector, but the democratic institutions and the commitment to reform and the resilience of the Moldovan people and their faith in the government is important to ensure that the free and fair elections for this year's presidential election and next year's parliamentary elections take place. This is vital because <clears throat> it's not about the outcome. I mean, of course, we hope that uh, the people's voices will be heard and their determination to join the EU and be uh, inextricably part of a Western and Euro-Atlantic future will be uh, seen and heard and, and resulting at the polls. But for us, at least for my agency, what we are really focused on is the integrity of the process in and of itself. Because that faith in a democratic process and participating in the future of your country by voting your passion, your values, and what you believe in is fundamental. And so we are working um, very hard to ensure that the process is free, fair, transparent, and will um, be valid. Because it is public knowledge that the Kremlin has spent millions of dollars to subvert past elections, and there's no question that they will continue, the, that Putin and the Kremlin will continue these efforts. We also know that the Kremlin will continue to spread false information to create a smear campaign around those Moldovans in the government and civil society who are fighting for reform, who have led Moldova this far to the, so many of the successes and progress that we are celebrating from last year to this, and those that are fighting for EU integration and for a better future. In America, where we are here, sort of in the seat of America, <laughs> capital. <laughs> um, elections are an essential way for citizens to engage their government. And all democracies benefit when voter turnout is high, where the greatest number of people participate and where their voices are heard. And the Russian government may use all of the tools in their toolkit to influence this election, but USAID, and I have a lot of my team from Chisinau here, wave your hands everybody, yay, I think you guys all know them. Um, we'll continue our work hand in glove with stakeholders in government and civil society to ensure that the electoral process aligns with international standards. And despite Russia's attempts at malign influence, Moldovans have continued their progress towards this democratic development and future that is a triumph for all of us to celebrate. Moldova shines bright with the hope of a better future as their citizens say no to corruption no to manipulation, often in the face of malign influence, blatant malign influence from abroad. In December last year, USAID was proud that the efforts the Moldovans have taken to strengthen their democracy was recognized by the European Council's decision to open EU accession talks with Moldova and Ukraine. Moldova is unquestioningly moving in a positive direction. One, a direction that leads towards 
the goal of being free, independent, and democratic, and the necessary and courageous reform process. And everybody's like reforms, that's, point, you know, it's process, it's laws, no, it's fundamental, it's vital. It's the government demonstrating to its people that we heard you, and we also say no to corruption. We also say no to manipulation. And by taking on those necessary reforms, uh, they are now uh, a candidate for EU accession, and that is something that, again, all of you in this room and everyone back in Moldova should be very proud of. So USAID, my agency, understands, together with the entire country team, under Ambassador Logson's leadership, and we are very sad you're leaving. Um, <clears throat> our work is more important now than it has ever been before. We are partnering with, with Moldova to further democracy's dividends across several sectors. And I'd just like to highlight, as, as Ambassador Logson mentioned, a few areas, a few details that many of you may not be aware of, particularly in the area of er, the sectors of energy, technology, and investment in Moldova's youth. We aren't just working today to help Moldova succeed in its EU aspirations and achieve democracy and prosperity. We are also investing in the next generation so that that commitment and that bright future endures. So first, the energy sector. Energy independence and diversification, as I already mentioned, is vital to Moldova's long-term prosperity and security. So USAID supports energy sector reforms to liberalize the energy market. And liberalization and, market, um, and liberalizing the market is really important because it shines a light on the process and the transactions and crowds out those that would manipulate the energy sector for their own goods, oligarchs, kleptocrats, and no good nicks, as some of our friends on the Hill would say. We also are establishing direct access to future markets. And in cooperation with the government of Moldova and the private sector, because tax dollars can't do it alone, we continue to increase, increase renewable energy generation and improve energy efficiency. And to that end, we're working to stabilize Moldova's, Moldova's electricity grid and enable Moldova to increase the amount of low-cost renewable energy generation. That's an investment not only for energy security and independence, but it's an investment in, a, in the future where the lights, the heat, the homes, the schools, the hospitals, the entrepreneurs, everyone can have a safe, secure, reliable source of energy to be the engine of growth that Moldova needs, is using, but will need if we are all successful even more in the future. Second, technology. We have an opportunity to accelerate Moldova's path towards digital transformation. Moldova is rapidly advancing towards its goal of digitizing public sector, services, and essential infrastructure. And this leverages the strong capabilities in IT, generating investment and providing employment opportunities. Digitized public services contribute to building trust in public institutions and in reducing corruption. But at the same time, we are, so we are using technology to further Moldova's democratic goals. We are also, at the same time, protecting that information. Ambassador Logston mentioned uh, cybersecurity. It's really important that as you put more information and more services online that you boost citizens' confidence in accessing those services and having their information in the government's hands. It's both sides of the coin. So we aren't blind to that need and are working in parallel to ensure that the more transparent, accountable service delivery and information that's out there is also protected and secure and safe. E-commerce, in addition to government services, e-commerce initiatives are paving the way for Moldovan businesses to take advantage of these new opportunities. Thousands of entrepreneurs in tourism and fashion, winemaking, manufacturing, and other um, sectors attend free web webinars on e-commerce and a variety of other capacity-building, digital-driven uh, ways to help them grow their business, make greater connections, and all at a very low cost. The ambassador mentioned um, the agreement signed with 
Amazon, as well as Microsoft, and I'm proud to say that we were also able to secure support from Google, a contribution of up to $1 million to be able to help build out that digital infrastructure, both for good governance, but also for business. Finally, we are working hand in hand with the Moldova e-government agency to develop the Evo Super App. I'm just learning about this now. My team gave me these talking marks, so bear with me. The Evo Super App is a one-stop shop for all public services in Moldova, or a government in your pocket, as some might call it. I wish we could do that here. <laughs> the Super App was approved by the Moldovan cabinet in January of 2024, so just four months ago and USAID is actively supporting the development team. The beta version launched in just a few weeks, um, or just a few weeks ago, with more than 3,000 Moldovans registered in the first week. This app will help citizens and businesses tap into more than 300 digital government services and thus increase transparency, as well as those connections we were talking about. That's really exciting, so I can't wait to see the Evo Super app in action, <laughs> just looking at my team. Okay, now finally I wanna talk about uh, the future generations in Moldova. At USAID, and frankly, um, I'm sure all of you share the same commitment or conviction, a country's prosperity is built not by governments, but by its people. When given education and employment opportunities, young people are be better able to build the future that they want to have. USAID has established STEAM programs. Now, a lot of you hear about STEM, but you know, they did a lot of studying and the A part, the arts, is equally important to have that balance. And we know that the creative art cap capability and industry in Moldova is a huge driver for both change as well as offering for the rest of the world. So our STEAM initiatives have helped Moldova educational, um, Moldova educational robotics programs in more than 200 K through 12 schools, consistently securing top positions in international competitions. USAID also facilitated the introduction of three bachelor's degree programs in new, in new media, game design, and animation. The these future professions uh, programs at Moldovan universities educate new era media specialists and will create over 20 new job roles, not just jobs, but these roles and redefining what the employment base and um, opportunities will look like in Moldova for the future. It's pretty exciting. We connected the University of California, go Bears, I went to, Ber I went to at Berkeley. Um, and actually, can I just say something about California? I, we've been talking about North Carolina a lot, <laughs> which is appropriate. They've been a strong partner. But think about it. IT, creative industry, wine industry. <laughs> Moldova needs to be the California of Europe. <laughs> so we're putting pieces in place for that. Uh, the University of California, Berkeley, with the Technical University of Moldova and the State University of Moldova to institutionalize this work, these partnerships, these bachelor's programs, these, this industry beyond our development assistance. We have a lot to show for our efforts, but there re remains a plethora, an inordinate amount of challenges ahead. The looming specter of Putin's aggression threatens that progress and demands un wavering vigilance and commitment. Moldova stands poised to make its mark on the world stage. Not just Europe, not just America, but the world. From rich cultural traditions to cutting edge technology, the people of Moldova are driving economic growth and market integration. So now more than ever, we must stand shoulder to shoulder, demonstrating that democracy is not just a lofty ideal, it's a proven pathway for prosperity, security, a brighter future for every Moldovan citizen. So together, let's forge ahead 
united in our pursuit of a brighter, more democratic, and self-determined future for all Moldovans. And I thank you for inviting me to speak to you today, and I look forward to continuing to engage with your work as you celebrate your 10th annual MAC. Uh, do we have time for one quick question? Um, we have one more panel. Um, one quick question. <laughs> and one short answer, please. Yes, anyone? Oh, no one? Yeah. <laughs> like, anyone? No? Should we just continue? That's yes. great. Yeah, we're just really happy to be here and to show you what your U.S. government tax dollars are supporting in the Republic of Moldova. That's really the bottom line of what Aaron and I were trying to do today. I hope that all of you uh, felt good about where those tax dollars are going. We can tell you that we take great care to make sure that we get everything possible out of each dollar. But I think all of you can be very proud of what you've done and what you're doing to support um, Moldova because we take it all very seriously. And then thank you for being good U.S. tax payers who will right. help us out. That's good too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Moldova and the Moldovan people are really appreciating the trustness, uh, trusted partnerships that we have. And now I want to invite uh, Mr. Lars Lohnbeck, Chief IOM Mission to Moldova. Please join us on stage. Mr. John Bri Jeff Bryan, Mission Director, USAID Moldova. And Ms. Stella Jemna, Country Representative for Moldova Western INS Enterprise Fund. Okay, um, thank you very much, Elena. Thank you so much for inviting IOM. Do we have the microphone? Does it? Are we hearing? Okay. Just a little bit closer. Elena, thank you so much for inviting IOM. Uh, it's uh, extremely inspiring for an organization that works so much with diaspora to be here amongst the diaspora and, and seeing the power of, of the diaspora. Uh, uh, we're really proud uh, to be called a, a trusted partner. Uh, God knows uh, we have been working with uh, diaspora issues in Moldova since 2007. Uh, and, and I think that you'll be uh, very happy to hear uh, that we have been helping to establish these household uh, names in the diaspora circles like the Diaspora Relations Bureau. We have representatives here, uh, the PARE 1 plus 1, uh, the uh, uh, Return of Qualified Nationals programs, the Out of Voting uh, programs, uh, etc., etc. So uh, this is a long-term commitment that we have. It's a core part of our organization's work. I was just uh, hearing a quite interesting uh, anecdote, uh, and I wanted to just share it with you. Uh, and it relates to the, the government's uh, own my, uh, diaspora conference. And we're harking back to uh, uh, 2008, which was the second national congress. Uh, and it was led by President Voronin at the time. Uh, and what I understand at that time, <clears throat> the diaspora was a bit more uh, restricted, or at least the perception of it was more restricted. Apparently, the, uh, the, uh, the proceedings were taking place in Russian because mainly the people were coming from Central Asia or from the Russian Federation. Uh, and, but it's ironic that only uh, one year later in the elections of 2009 that the, the communist uh, government was voted out. And I think, uh, if my information is correct, the, the, the thumb on the scale was the diaspora again. 
So, so these are extremely interesting and, and inspiring and, and thoughtful uh, things. I just wanted to say that um, the, the, uh, the remittances, we, we have to just look a little bit technically at, at that. That is obviously 12% of the uh, uh, gross national product of Moldova, 1.7 uh, billion US dollars last year. That's enormous, of course, and, and keeping the balance of payments in, in shape in, in a way that no other really input uh, does. Uh, it is a lifeline for poor people. Uh, it is a good uh, an antidote for shocks, economic shocks, especially for po poor high households. Uh, but beyond these, uh, let's say, anonymous remittances, the foreign direct investment is quite notable. Uh, uh, individuals, we know that the, the record is 150 million that has been, been done. These have m massive uh, impacts uh, on the economy. Also to uh, more uh, poor uh, villages, uh, investments in the area of 1 million US dollars uh, is there. But of course, the, uh, the way in which the diaspora supports in terms of transmitting uh, skills, expertise, networks on trade, uh, enormously in, in important. And, and I have also heard now that uh, the phenomenon of medical tourism, not, uh, not so little from the diaspora, is spurring uh, the, uh, the medical profession and medical technical uh, capabilities. Also, I think there's a bit of dentistry in there uh, as well. So, I mean, there are so many areas in, in which uh, the, uh, the uh, diaspora has an uh, impact. But IOM looks uh, not only at these remittances, but something that we call democratic uh, remittances. Uh, this is about sharing, and uh, we have been speaking about this so much, sp sharing the democratic values back home, uh, sharing a, a spirit of uh, participatory government. Um, and of course, uh, the diaspora shows up at the urns and I just wanted to show the, the percentages here. Last uh, uh, parliamentary election, the diaspora, the electorate, the, the percentage of the electorate that was the diaspora was 14%. This is quite re remarkable. At the presidential elections, the, the, a couple of six months previously, 16% uh, was the diaspora as part of the electorate. Quite remarkable, and obviously we've been speaking so much during these proceedings about the, the importance in the next 12 months of the elections uh, moving forward. Even if we saw recently some uh, polling that was going in the direct, right direction, but we cannot uh, cry victory uh, quite yet, uh, of course. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the government has done enormously. I cannot not uh, underline the way in which the government has stepped up in terms of supporting consular services, being, making them more user-friendly for diasporas across the world in terms of uh, legal documents, skills recognitions, uh, etc., etc. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, two words about the importance of, uh, of investments. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, Moldova suffered uh, quite a lot under COVID, but now the war in neighboring uh, Ukraine. I think the good news uh, is that the government was able to weather the storm in the sense that it was already mentioned the one million Ukrainian refugees that the majority of them passed through, but still a lot of them remain. Policies, support remain for these refugees. They have not created a crisis for the country as such. Also, the support for the, the, the energy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's a responsibility taken there. So now it is the long game that uh, is for stability, economic renewal, and the diaspora uh, plays an enormous role in that regard. So just to roll off the, the programs that are there, PARI 1 plus 1 I already mentioned, it's been there for a number of years, creating and mentoring uh, more than uh, 2,200 businesses creating 7,000 jobs, 6,000 returnees. The new Diary 1 plus 3 program on local development is taking off. More than 100 programs all, already, 60 more this year to be announced. And finally, just to mention, 
uh, an inno innovative uh, climate change and innovation investment fund concept. That uh, would, is not just for investment for charity, but actually something that would render uh, uh, returns on investment. But the focus there, and this is what we have surveyed, is that there is a very strong uh, uh, investment willingness when you see that there is a fund that has a very clear profile on the green business development. Uh, this uh, CIIF, uh, as the acronym is, was developed with expertise uh, in the London-based Justin Skarks Innovest Advisory and has been tested in a number of focus groups amongst the best investors, for instance, in New York. And I think that with your support, we would be able to launch this program in this year. And, and it's funny, uh, I was able to make some contacts with uh, some very key people already uh, today in this room, and I think that we're moving forward. So my conclusion is, is just, uh, it's time to invest your vote, uh, and it's in time to invest in the greening of the Moldovan economy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Bună ziua. Este o mare plăcere să fiu aici astăzi în această sală frumoasă pentru cel mai important eveniment pentru diaspora dobenesti. Um, mulțumesc. Um, since the Moldovan colleagues haven't been speaking Romanian, I thought I would say a few words. Um, I'm really proud to be here. You've heard a lot from USAID, um, so I'll be brief. You heard from my boss and my boss's boss. So I, I, won't I won't go into all of our projects and programs because there are so many. Uh, but I would just, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be here and to meet you, uh, like I said, in this beautiful room in the capital of the United States uh, with you. Um, also because personally I consider myself part of the diaspora because my wife is Moldovan. Uh, our children were born when we lived in Moldova. I first moved to Moldova in 2010. And that was a time that was not so different from today in, in some ways. There had been a change in government. There was a new pro-European government uh, that was focused on EU integration uh, in power. We worked very closely with that government for the four years that I was there, um, leading to the first signature of the association agreement with the EU. So a lot of the same energy was going on. Um, unfortunately, by the time I left in 2014, the geopolitical situation was changing. Uh, Russia had invaded Crimea. So again, echoes of, of what's going on today. But then just after I left, there was the heartbreaking um, theft of a billion dollars from uh, Moldova's government, from, from its people. Uh, I, again, that was heartbreaking. Um, I was away for almost a decade, and now we've had the chance to come back, my family and I, to return to Moldova. Uh, people often ask me, how is it? Is it different? How's Chisinau now? It's, it really is much more beautiful. So if you haven't been back recently, you'll probably notice a lot of change in the city. Um, I guess all I'd really like to say is that our work as USAID and, and my colleagues here, Moldovan colleagues especially, uh, Rodika Miron and Roman Puric, uh, people who've dedicated their entire careers to supporting these activities. And we have generations of programs going back 30 years of work in these areas of democracy, private sector-led economic growth, uh, justice sector reform, so all of the results that we see today uh, are really built on the foundations of those 30 years of partnership. And that puts Moldova in the position uh, to be able to stand up to Russian aggression um, and to push back. And I'm really proud to be there and to be able to be part of it. And now with the new energy sector, uh, more than $300 million that you heard about and supplemental funding that we're using to build hard infrastructure, uh, like a transmission line to Romania, and battery storage systems that are going to make Moldova energy independent. Um, and so you've heard a lot of, about some of the most important programs, but I did want to mention one thing that might be especially relevant to many of you who have some connection with IT uh, or IT adjacent um, activities. It's the Moldova uh, IT park um, that USAID has helped support right now. Uh, the IT park has more than 1,600 companies active, uh, and the new I, the IT park law has been extended through 2037, 
which guarantees a very flat, or a 7% flat tax rate, an attractive rate for companies in the IT sector, but also companies like uh, business process outsourcing, and that relates to the trucking industry that I know is really important for Moldova, for the diaspora. So uh, that's one great uh, successful thing that's going on now. And I wanted to mention also something in the last year that's been a huge, uh, that, that made me really happy to see was in relation to the support that we've provided to robotics and STEAM education in schools, that last year it was a team of Moldovan high school kids in Singapore who won first place in the global competition for robotics in the whole world. <laughs> It was just amazing to see those kids, and, and you can all be proud of that, but it also made me worried because what's their future going to be? Are they going to emigrate, uh, or are they going to have jobs in Moldova, like good jobs that they can also, uh, some people choose to stay, and so we're doing everything we can to, uh, that you've heard a lot about to help create that uh, environment for jobs and opportunities and education and healthcare and things that um, give those opportunities in Moldova, and for some of you who might choose to invest or to even come back to Moldova. So um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great to meet you, to make new friends. Uh, 30 years ago, I think the big question was, uh, is Moldova going to reunite with Romania? Well, the big question today, well, it's not a question. Uh, the answer today is that Moldova is going to reunite with Romania, but as in the European Union, Union as the other Romanian-speaking country in the European Union. And so we're glad to be able to be uh, part of that and to support the process. Thank you. The, the most difficult part uh, left to me because everyone wants to leave uh, to change their clothes. But, uh, I'm going to keep you a little bit longer. Um, so I've been to three uh, conventions now. Yeah. The first time when I have been here, I was a student uh, at Georgia State University as a Fulbrighter. That was my first convention. The second one, I came as the chief of staff of the prime minister. And the third one, uh, I'm coming as a country representative for a regional investment fund. This is good. You know, we are progressing. And such is progressing our country. So my idea was to increase the optimism because I know that you don't have time to find out more about uh, Moldova. By the way, yesterday I received the feedback that uh, the last convention I uh, came, I encouraged a few people to apply to some uh, projects in Moldova, right? Yes. Here you go. So it's interesting what's going to happen after this one. Uh, so the uh, fund that I'm representing is a $285 million fund. So the problem in Moldova is not the money. Uh, it's the ideas and the interesting businesses. So if you are trying to find investment, uh, you can come to me and we can discuss more details. We will not go into those details uh, right now because we don't have enough time. But one thing that I wanted to say is that be besides investment, that this fund is 29 years in Moldova invested. I think it created 26,000 jobs in Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, now uh, we have a lot of uh, development uh, funds and we are uh, implementing a lot of uh, projects. Uh, back home, uh, so I will refer to several of them, uh, and a lot of them we have synergies with USAID, which is very important because in the past we would have a lot of donors, but they will not have time to discuss with each other, and this time we are working pretty close together. Uh, so one thing what I wanted to tell you, in 2025, most likely all of you are going to see a movie about Moldova on Netflix. How about that? So uh, we will fund, we just uh, started, we will fund uh, three series on Netflix about Moldova, North, South and Center. Uh, I mean, we have uh, money for two series, hopefully we'll find for the third one. Uh, so we want to promote the country on the international platform and we thought that Netflix is the best one to do it. Because you know when you come, uh, like you ha every time you have to present Moldova, so if it's on Netflix, then you don't have to present Moldova. <laughs> Uh, second, so we are working together with USAID here. Diana Lazar is here, so you have to meet her. Diana, you can uh, shake your hand. So 
She is doing a great job on the export promotion on all our fruits, vegetables, wines in Moldova. So if you want to know more, you have to get in touch with her. Another project that we are doing uh, very nicely, what you said about robotics, we, are, uh, we thought that it's good to have more schools and faster. So basically, uh, we added money to USAID money, so now we have 129 schools that have robotics in Moldova, which is very cool. Um, and uh, other projects, we are doing a lot of work with uh, accelerators. Uh, we just gave half million dollars to WADA uh, for startups and innovation. We selected 100 companies that are developing startups in, and innovation in Moldova, and we want to invest a lot in uh, tech startups. So again, if you think about different ideas in that sense, if you want to invest, please come and find me. So, you know, we can talk a lot, but you have to understand that the speed that Moldova took is uh, it's a high speed for development. Yes, we have a lot of problems. We know all of them. We really work on them. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, successful, sometimes less successful. Uh, but the overall thing is that, uh, you know, we are all working together on the stage, in these groups, uh, to make uh, Moldova a brighter place. And uh, I wanted to congratulate you that you are part of this process. And uh, thank you. And uh, I know a lot of you invest in Moldova, so uh, you are always welcome to, you know, uh, have a masa rotunda, patrata, or whichever masa you want when you are back home. Thank you very much and uh, waiting for you to come back home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, presenters, and thank you everyone for being part of this town hall um, here and this afternoon. Now we have a few minutes left for some glasses of Moldovan champagne. Uh, Please join us here at the table. And we are waiting for you at 6 o'clock um, here at the library for the gala, Mark 10 gala. Please be on time. Thank you. Join us here at the tables. Thank you. For live streaming, see you in two hours. Bye. Revedevando ore.